I remember the moment that I realized critical race theory was a lie. I was in the parking lot of Van Skate Park, giddy and amazed to have made it out of an Orange County landmark with my limbs intact. I'd had a surprisingly chill skate session. I turned to my friend and asked how their experience of the park was, being that they too were a member of a minority group. Expectant of a chill session like my own, I was surprised to learn that their experience was not as cheery. As a black woman who wore intersectional critical race theory goggles, each day that I woke up was a day I expected ostracization in a patriarchal, heteronormative, white environment. The moment my friend expressed a different experience from the one that I'd observed was the moment a crack formed in my critical lens. My love for skateboarding began when I was about nine, watching Tony Hawk and the X Games. All I saw was the sport, but my older siblings would constantly remind me that I was a black girl and black girls don't skate. I couldn't see what those characteristics had to do with standing on a wooden plank with wheels. But studying critical race theory in college solidified such insecurities. My fear of discrimination was seeded during time I'd spent living in South Africa, was watered by critical race theory in academia, and had bloomed to form an indomitable wall that would take a lot of conviction to break. I was committed to claiming space in spheres dominated by white men. In 2019, the LA skateboarding scene saw an explosion of diversity. And in typical lagger fashion, I was encouraged to start skateboarding again. Girls skate meetups helped me shake off the nerves associated with being the anomaly at a skate park. I made amazing friends and formed a network of support. But soon enough, scheduling conflicts forced me to skate on my own outside of those meetups. This also meant that, according to my critical race theory goggles, I'd become bully prey for the patriarchal white men who dominated the sport. The perceived danger surrounding traditional skate culture led me to initiate a YouTube series titled Is It Safe? which documented my experience at skate parks across Los Angeles and rated the vibe of the environment for other curious queer, black, or femme skaters. I first went into Lake Street and Cherry Park skate parks, braced for microaggressions and an assertion of dominance by people who didn't look like me. But to my surprise, I was met with an extension of kindness and courteousness by the people who weren't supposed to possess either of those qualities. As a YouTube documentarian, I'd gone into these settings as a blank slate, more open-minded to the results I'd find than my close-minded critical race theory goggles might usually allow. On continued trips to other skate parks, I kept finding similar results realizing the parks were far from the monstrosities I had conjured up in my head. Once I visited Van Skate Park with my friends and received similar positive treatment, while my friends who were treated the same still perceived mistreatment, I began to wonder if my own attitude going into these spaces was affecting my experiences. I eventually gave up on my Is It Safe series as I realized I'd probably emerge with the same results over and over again. My interactions with white male skaters from there on out were fairly neutral. Celebration, credit, and collaboration were granted where they were due. I began to take on a very individualistic approach to social interactions and stopped worshiping at the altar of cynicism. But as those interactions improved, it wasn't too long before my interactions with my woke friends frayed. They would arrange patronizing sit-downs to teach me about my position in society, like a child getting the birds and the bees talk. They saw my reluctance to use the critical framework as naive and ignorant. Their view of what a black feminist must think and be was more oppressive than actually going to skate parks. I assessed all the lessons of group identity and struggle and concluded that the baggage of anger, resentment, and groupthink was a load worth shedding in exchange for peace. To demand justice from and dismantle a system that only existed in my friends' heads was not worth my real physical energy. 
I realized my real enemy was my own resentment. There is a popular quote, resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. Many have forgotten that those words were most famously spoken by Nelson Mandela. If Mandela, who survived 27 years of imprisonment under a racist regime and ultimately united a country torn apart by apartheid, determined that resentment was the real poison, then why are we advocating for a nation to drink the poison of critical race theory? I'm Kimi Katiti. Join me in standing up for a pro-human future at fairforall.org.